Hello, uh, very good evening and welcome to Government in Transition. I'm your host, Eddie Lane. I'm joined this evening by uh, three distinguished candidates of the People's Progressive Party Civic, uh, Hugh Todd, Vishal Ambedkar, and of course, uh, Vishalia Sharma. Ladies, gentlemen, good evening and welcome to the program. Good evening, Ed. Good evening, Ed. Good evening, Ed, and thank you. Oh, you, you're, you're on the other side tonight. Um, you're, you, you're not the moderator tonight. You're on the side of a guest tonight. Um, but I'm happy to have you guys here uh, so that we can discuss, as we do every uh, single evening, is to update the people of Guyana on the current status uh, with regards to the March 2nd general uh, regional elections. We are about four and a half months after March 2nd when Guyanese went to the polls and voted. The world knows the results of the elections. Um, that the People's Progressive Party Civic received 233,336 votes. The APNU AFC 217,920, a difference in favor of the PDP by 15,416. Nonetheless, Dr. Irfan Ali is still to be sworn in as the elected president of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, and more so the People's Progressive Party Civic Government is still to be in place. We know what happened after March 2nd. Um, the losers, rather than taking the licks like men, based on what uh, one former uh, CARICOM prime minister would have said, they have been using every single avenue um, to stymie the process, to delay the process. Uh, the most recent being uh, moving to the courts, uh, and that matter was hard today. What essentially they're doing there, and I'll start with you, uh, you Todd. What essentially they're doing there is really going to the court to say to the court, look, we're trying to steal this election. And the PPP and GCOM, they're blocking us. Could you at least rule and tell them that they should allow us to steal the elections? That is essentially what we're seeing there, you know, because the numbers are against them, but they're moving to the court. And I, I heard Basil Williams telling the court that GCOM must declare David Granger the elected president. As much as Basil Williams is mad, I, I don't know, you know, what is really happening in the coalition. You thought, I, I don't know if you can help us here. Uh, thank you, Ed, once again for, for having me on your program. I think all of Ghana uh, is fully aware of the modus operandi of the People's National Congress led coalition government. I, I think people have to understand that the conception of that party was, was fundamentally flawed. Um, it was built on political opportunism and to keep that going, you have to have a very active and vibrant, vibrant propaganda machinery. So what you have seen with the PNC-led coalition um, government uh, post uh, May 2015 was propaganda in overdrive. Um, you have to remember that they believe in party paramountcy. They believe that the party should be above every other political and economic organization. They believe that only the PNC should be in charge of the state. They believe that the state was gifted to them for some strange reason. And they've continued along that vein throughout their, their history. If you notice, um, back in their head, they, they control nearly up to 90% of the economy. So they had a firm grip on the economy between 1968 and I was say 1973 between 1973 and 1992, or to the latter parts of the 1980s. So that is what they've been accustomed to. That is what they want. That is their desire. And they will do anything in their power to find a way to hold on to power. Now, you have to understand is that they don't see themselves as representatives of the people. They see themselves as rulers. They see themselves as being entitled to govern indefinitely. So the whole talk about democracy and the rule of law, it matters not to them. They're only saying that because they, they know that the international system demands that of you. So they will tell you that. But in their actions, you'll see something totally different. So all of the shenanigans you've seen being played out 
is them playing from the playbook that they are accustomed to. They have not evolved as a political party or political organization. They've never integrated within the, the region and within the global environment. And that is why you're seeing that disconnect. What you're seeing here is a political party that assumed office as a leader of a coalition and they dominated that coalition outfit. We knew all along that you will only get a Burnhamite regime if you vote for the APNU AFC. And we've seen that from the time they got into office, the unilateral appointment of David Patterson to control GCOM. We've seen the sign-on bonus that they hit from the public. We've seen all of the uh, excessive spending without any accountability. We've seen them corrupting institutions. We have seen the PNC-led coalition government making all, uh, making all of their plays to capture all of the institutions. So they knew very well that once they got into power, their aim was to hang on to it. And they went about trying to do that at great length. Unfortunately for them, Guyana has experienced 23 years of democracy under the Progressive Party Civic. We now understand how a government should operate within its confined borders and how open we are to the international system. We know the rules that we play by. We know that we, that we exist in a global environment where politics is globalized, economics is globalized. We have signed on to agreements, to treaties, to international institutions where democracy is a key tenant of doing business. If your, polit if your politics is not in order, then you would not have a seat at the table. And that is eventually what has happened to us as a people. My new Ed and colleagues, what we're seeing playing out here is not what the people are endorsing. The people said on March 2nd that they wanted a new political party in government. They said that to the ballot. This administration does not know how to accept rejection because everything that they do is based on dictatorship. And dictators do not see people as, 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 as individuals who they need to serve. You're just a number. So they can tax you, so they can violate your privileges, so that they can coerce you, they can manipulate you, and they can direct you and, allow, and, and try to make you a subject instead of an individual with individual rights and privileges. So what they're trying to do right now is to deny the electorate of their will. So everything that you've seen unfolding is them still trying to hold on to power. And their propaganda machinery is in overdrive. So they're, so they're playing ping pong between GCOM and, and the courts because they believe that if they do that, they can stay behind the, the red line and the international community would have to sit and wait. But the international community does not have to sit and wait because you have to understand something, Ed and colleagues. We operate an international system and we are on the periphery of that international system. It means that we depend heavily on the international system through remittances, for aid, for foreign investment, for trade, right? And for security. So tell me, if you were sitting on the periphery in the, or in the world system, your main aim is to play by the rules. You are the least of any of the nation states in this world that want to violate the rules that you've signed on. So the whole rhetoric about sovereignty, about interference, hogwash. This is a case whereby we sit at the lower end of the international environment, depend on the international environment and our additional partners for assistance, for help, and to help us grow and develop. And then we're turning around now and we're spewing all kinds of nonsense, saying that they need to get out of our business. No, they are in our business. We need them in our business. And the people of Guyana have stood up and they've said to the, to the rest of the world and to Guyana that we deserve a new government. And I hope you by saying that. Thanks, uh, Utah. Vishal, um, I want to bring you in here. 
you're a, a relatively young um, young man, and I guess you would have heard stories, and I think you touched a little bit on what the PNC of pre-1992 was. Um, and I, I figure when you see what is happening now, it is reminding you of those stories that you would have heard. I mean, many of us would have said in the past that, you know, uh, just can rely on these stories for now. We don't know what the PNC was and, and whether these stories were really true, but you had a first-hand experience, you're having a first-hand experience. And first of all, thank you for having me on the program and good evening to the rest of the panel and your viewers. Um, you're right. What we have witnessed over the last five years, and especially over the last two years, um, where we have the will of people, the will of young people, old people, the will of all Guyanese being subverted from the time the no confidence motion has passed. We would have heard stories about dictatorship. We would have heard stories about Barnum, the days of Barnum in the 60s. We would have heard stories about joining lines to get food and these kind of things right in, in, in the district where I live here. Um, during the, the, the 2020 campaign trail, I, I, I heard of a story of a woman by the name of Sumintra who actually joined a line back in the 60s for food. And by the time she received a pound of flour, she was waiting for a pound of flour. By the time she got that pound of flour, she dropped dead. You know, and we would have heard the stories and the difficulties that our people face, but never, never have I or could I have imagined that it would have would have happened in an era where I live in a time where I live, um, and it's been perpetrated by dinosaurs because these guys are from an era where we don't belong. Earlier today, I I, I mentioned uh, on another program that the voting population of Guyana, the voting population, over 50% of the voting population are young people, 45 years of age or younger. And how can these 75 year old pensioners plan a future for us? We want to decide what our future should be like. We want to be the persons who would mold and shape our future and take some control of our destiny. You know, Ed, I was fortunate. I was fortunate that I started working in the days of the People's Progressive Party. And I was fortunate to acquire a house lot. And you know, when I compare to that accomplishment that I had at that very young age, so what my father and grandfather would have accomplished in their days. My grandfather left this country, a 54-year-old man, left this country. And when he left this country, he did not yet own his own home. I was fortunate to own my own home in my 20s, something that my father and my grandfather could not accomplish. And it was all through the policies that was implemented by the People's Progressive Party civic government. And I know that a lot of people would say that whichever government is there, it doesn't matter because we still gotta live. But the policies implemented by any government will make it easier or harder for you to get by, you know? And so what we have seen here, look, uh, uh, speaking about house lots, I, when, I, when I said this at one of the meetings that we had in, in the Tushinai flood district. One of the, the, the guys that attended the meeting, they said, listen, you know, before 1992, before 1992, there was, wasn't even a Ministry of Housing. So this is to show you the planning and implementation policies of this government that we have, how it is lacking. They don't care for young people. If you look within the government organizations, all of the top jobs, the administrative jobs, are secured by pensioners, people who have been brought out of retirement. And uh, young people have just been left behind. And we are seeing more and more every day. We've seen more, uh, it is being 
presented to us more realistically now that these guys are just lovers of themselves, caring only for themselves, looking out for their own interests, and have forgotten about people, you know? And that's where we are. Uh, it's certainly uh, Vishal, um, and I, I'll probably say Vish and Vishalia so that I don't get the two names all uh, mixed up this evening. But Vishalia, I want to bring you in yes. here. And you're from the Barbies area uh, as well. But um, I'm sure you've been tracking what has been happening in our country. Um, if you were to look from post March 2nd, 2020, where there were naked attempts, blatant attempts, to steal an election. Yeah, good night, Eddie. Good night, everyone. And of course, good night to the viewers. Thanks for having me on on board tonight. Um, definitely, Eddie. Definitely, along the region, and along the region, everyone has been following closely what's going on. Importantly, because obviously it affects our lives. At the end of the day, the people of, of Guyana have clearly voted on March the second. Clearly voted. The winner is absolutely clear. There is absolutely, the international community is saying this, the CARICOM community has, has said this clearly. There is basically, as, as you, Todd, and Vishal have said, there's basically a group of people trying to hold on to power at absolutely any expense. But more, most importantly, what's happening is that this is happening at the expense of our people. If you go in the community, and I've been doing clinics, and even today I've done that. If you go to the community and you deal with, the, with, with people, you will understand that whatever they're doing for their selfish, selfish gain actually affecting our people. And our people are losing out at the end of the day, Eddie. We have the quality of life, be it its health. You thought when detailed and said what could possibly happen. Health could also be affected along that line. And basically, if this continues along the line, this would not be the quality of life that we as Guyanese deserve. We have voted clearly, and basically what they have done over the past four and a half months is trampled blatantly on our democracy. They have trampled on our rights as Guyanese. We, majority of the Guyanese, have said clearly that Dr. Irfan Ali, that they want, that should be declared as the president of Guyana and sworn in ultimately. However, like Vishal said, a group of people for their own selfish means, holding on to power at absolutely any cost without thinking for a moment. I don't know how, because I know we were, ta we were taught in med school to do our work in such a way that when we sleep, we can actually sleep with a clear conscience. I absolutely have no idea how that is done because ultimately what they do affect the lives of our people, especially at this point when our country is suffering from a pandemic, not just Guyana, globally, which everybody knows. I go into work in the morning, which everybody does. They will know that the amount of places that close in, the amount of people that are out of a job, these people have family to feed. They have kids, kids kids to go to school, health care to look after. These basic rights are basically being trampled upon. We're not being able, it's, it's, it's absolutely no, no regard, no regard for us. The people have clearly spoken, Ed, clearly spoken on March the 2nd. Thanks. Uh, Vishala, you, you, you said just now that, um you know, the world would have spoken. And you ask the question, how are these guys sleeping at nights? Um, Absolutely, Eddie. Absolutely. I'm not too sure if they're having a difficulty. I, I'm going to be honest with you. And I'm seeing you smiling there. Um, you will, will have gone through these issues over and over. These guys know exactly the results of these elections. Exactly. You have a Absolutely. bunch of people Without a doubt. who, regardless of what, they want to hold on to power. They want to, to remain there. 
And every single attempt they make to stymie this process, to delay this process, could be, of, could be for only a few reasons. One, they want to continue to pill for the treasury like they're doing. They want to continue to transfer state assets to their friends and cronies. And maybe they want to cover their tracks, as we say, for all the corruption that would have taken place um, over the last five years. But I want us to, to examine where they are. And I keep using, and, and I, I guess most of you can relate to this example. You know that there is a, a, a game you play as kids. The farmer rings the bell. And that ends with the cheese stands alone. And that is what we have here. Apnu AFC is standing alone because they're the only persons who are claiming victory, are claiming that the results of the elections were in their favor. You have had the CARICOM. You have had the Commonwealth. You have had the OAS, you have had the European Union, you have had hundreds of non-governmental organizations, including the elders, the, the organization that was founded by uh, the late Nelson Mandela. And you have had individual countries, uh, countries like uh, Norway and others. You've had Brazil just a few days ago. I think it was yesterday Brazil made a statement and you've had individual leaders around the country and influential people, all of them say, you've lost the elections, take your legs like a man and step aside. But they're the only ones claiming victory. You, it's, it's, it's I, I don't know how to, to really process something like this, you know, where everybody is telling you that you lost, but you're saying, no, I won. Yes. Uh, that was directed to me, Ed. Yes, yes, go straight ahead. Well, it, it's, it can be looked at from this perspective. Remember, you're dealing with dictators. And you have to understand the mind of a dictator. Um, he or she believes in what is good for them. And in political theory, we always say politicians are rational. So in their head, they believe that if they are going to go into elections, whether the electorate is on their side or not, they believe that they have a right to rule. So they're starting from that perspective, that listen, we will always be in charge. It doesn't matter what people say at the ballot because they don't cater to you. They don't have a perspective where they see themselves as, as servants, as elected representatives. But what has happened, because the world has shifted over the last 30 years from bipolarity to, to a more multi, uh, more plural environment where you have so many powerful actors. What has happened to the PNCs is that they've been left behind. So there's a disconnect. So what they're playing on is their old, uh, uh, him sheet. So remember back in the in the 60s and 70s, they basically enjoyed um, some level of, of, of support from, from the United States and the West, and it, it, it's in context. But when you fast forward to the 2000s, the 21st century, it's a whole different dispensation. The world is now driven by a different set of rules, and most of the world's economies, they're operating within the same framework. Ghana is no different. The only thing different here is the PNC. And they were able to string along the other smaller parties and, and the AFC. And I've seen some of the other smaller parties distance themselves eventually, but it took too long in my view. So what you've had here is a PNC-led coalition that has, you know, unfortunately still a sizable amount of support, trying to use that convince themselves that they should stay in power. So what they've embarked on is a dictatorial journey. So for them, it doesn't really matter what you say, because in their mind, they should always be in charge of the state. They have not evolved. Many people thought they would have evolved. So things would have changed. Um, they had new persons coming on board. 
And there's a reason why when you look at the hierarchy of the, of the PNC, it is still heavily stacked with people who came from that era. Because Granger knew that he needed to continue with the same old policies. So what he did, he surrounded himself with persons who were still committed to that type of thinking and ideology. But it is a, it is a misfit because it, does not, it is not compatible with the current trend. And that is why they're in this, this bind, because the PNC alone is trying to say to the rest of the world that they should remain in power. They're not fooling themselves. This is what they believe in. They know the rest of the world is saying, listen, you need to come in line with what is not for the planet and for the hemisphere and for the global environment. Granger and his cabal understand because they've never practiced being a servant. They've always seen, them, seen themselves as rulers, right? And people who should be always in charge. And it's difficult, you know. Think about it then, colleagues. If you don't see yourself as an elected representative, as a servant of the people, how can you accept the wishes of those people? It's, it's not going to happen. So what you've seen following March 2nd is the PNC saying to the people, how dare you? I am going to show you that I am going to force myself upon you. We don't accept rejection because we should always be in charge. Unfortunately for them, they don't have the at all. So for them, it doesn't matter what they try. It doesn't matter what they do. They're not going to succeed because the forces here in Guyana, the democratic forces here in Guyana, the democratic forces that we have within the Caribbean and the wider region and, and, and the wider world would be easily able to push back against the forces coming out of Congress. Place. So if you look at Congress Place and you situate Congress Place in Guyana, they can't compete. Then you situate them in the hemisphere. Think about it. Then you situate Congress Place in the rest of the world. Not feasible. They're not going to change. But the forces, of the democratic forces, will overwhelm them and it will get to a point where they have to vacate. There's no there's no ifs and buts about that. Many people sometimes get a bit, a bit worried and concerned because they're saying, these guys seem so confident. Oh, they're not going anywhere. They're going to hang on to power. And I always say to them, it's a process. Be patient. It is a process. And we've seen already a move by the United States in that direction. And I, I don't know if you're going to get to that, uh, particularly in the, in the segment. So I don't want to get into too much. I'll give my other colleagues a chance to, to, to add it. But I'll stop there for now. Uh, certainly you. And um, what you did just now in your, your, your final few words is to really take us to the next issue I want us to address. And that is already, no matter how much they try to use the legal system, no matter how much they try to use uh, to, to, to spew propaganda and misinformation, the fact of the matter is the recount process was very transparent. It was also broadcast via, in the first instance, with regards to the counting of the ballots. There was an audio feed that could have been heard globally. And in terms of the tabulation of, of the recount numbers, it was done with a video feed. So the world saw what happened. The world already know that these guys were going there and just pulling serial numbers out of, of anywhere and <clears throat> make, make objections without any evidence. Um, and I think the world has begun to react. And we have seen the United States already taking the necessary actions the first stage, rather, um, of, of, of actions with regards to personal sanctions where you had the visas of the Riggers and their immediate uh, family uh, being revoked uh, um, in the first instance. Vishal, I want to bring you here. Sanction is an extremely serious thing. Um, yes, Ed, sanctions is very serious. But first of all, 
we, we need to know why sanctions. Um, basically, sanctions are imposed on individuals of a particular country or group of individuals of a particular country um, so that the rest of the civilized world will get them to act in a civilized way in responding and respecting the rule of law and constitution of their very own country. You know, the People's Progressive Party knows the effects that sanctions will have on the ordinary man. And so we have asked and we support that sanctions be placed on individuals or the group of individuals who are bent to support the will of the people. You know, these people are so determined Ed, that they are calling evil good and good evil. And they're trying to let the entire world believe that. The People's Progressive Party has never, has never made any representation. And we've said it openly that we don't want sanctions on our people because this administration has already dished out and served our people on due hardships. And during this COVID pandemic, they are faced with additional hardship to couple with the plague that we have in representation of APNO. These guys are not more than parasites, you know? Um, we, young people, we are being shamed in front of the entire world. These guys are in their 70s. We have years more ahead of us. And I'm pretty sure that any pregnant woman looking at this program now, they're not named their child Mingo, you know, or Low Winfield. These guys, these guys, I, I don't know, man. Listen, we look at, if, if you follow the, the case during the course of today, you would hear Basil making representation at Low Winfield is the only man that can produce numbers and whatever he produces or presents to the commission, they have to accept. Well, it means therefore, it was a waste of time for me and the thousand of Guyanese who woke up six o'clock that morning, joined the lines, went into the polling place, marked our X, stained our fingers, went home and were waiting for the results. What was the point of all that? You might as well just call the Winfield into a room I'd say, okay, who do you want to win the elections? Who you think that we should form the next government and have him declare that, you know? So we are being shamed, you know? Um, it is time, it is time for this government to stop refusing the people, the will of the people and return the power that was lent to them by us. And we have chosen Dr. Irfan Ali to lead us and to lead this country for the next five years. And, you know, we can only get better from here. I know that the future is going to be in good hands with a PPP government and Dr. Irfan Ali as president. You know, uh, it, it is amazing sometimes when you hear some of the, 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 the insanity that these guys preach and try to present to any rational thinking person, you know, uh, it just goes to show their mindset and how they view the people which, you know, like you said earlier, they see themselves as rulers. And so whatever they preach to people, people should take it as gospel too. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Vish. Um, Vishal, I bring you in here. Um, sure, Ed. And before I, before I ask you to come in, I want to just add to what you said, uh, Ravish. And I want to make this clear because this has been the new propaganda that they're spewing with regards to sanctions. And I want to just support the point that you made earlier. The People's Progressive Party Civic has never and will never ever call on any other country to impose sanctions on Guyana as a country because we understand that sanctions have very, very devastating impacts and consequences on the lives of the poor people in this country. But we will, as we go along, discuss 
if we were to reach a point of sanctions on the country, how it could impact our people. So we have never called for sanctions in Guyana. We have always maintained and keep repeating the point that sanctions should be imposed on those who are seeking to thwart the will of the people, those who are seeking to trample on our democracy, and those who are seeking to aid and abet David Granger in becoming a dictator. So we should make that point clear, that the PP has never and will never call for sanctions on Diana. We want those who are trying to steal the elections to be sanctioned, and it is exactly what the United States has started with, by imposing sanctions on specific individuals who are part and parcel of that rigging cabal. Michelle, I bring you in here now. Sure. Oh, definitely. Um, definitely, that's one of the things is that the People's Progressive Party has no point, as you clearly mentioned. Sanction has an effect that none of us want for our country. Guyana is absolutely a beautiful country. If you start even thinking along the healthcare system, basically all the system, in Venezuela, for example, in one year, the they, they indicators drops increase significantly. And that's just one indicator, the maternal mortality, all because of sanctions. Now, the thing is, the PPP clearly stands ground in that sanctions of personal nature, not to affect the entire country, um, as you and you, Todd, and Vishal would have stated. Um, and of course, that's not the direction where we want to go as a, as a country. The PPPC, the people have spoken the results are clear. And as we shall clearly stated, Guyana has a beautiful future ahead. The people has clearly chosen the PPPC to lead us for the next five years. And it's absolutely clear. It, it's very, very clear. Everybody is seeing that except, except the few people in the, in the APNU, a few people in the APNU. Um, and definitely, you didn't mention in terms of the international community applying pressure. Yeah, definitely, that has been ongoing with the sanctions that started earlier this week. And also, you know, at this week, CARICOM would also be meeting as well as OAS, both along that direction in terms of making a decision or discussing our situation further. As young people in Guyana, that's not how we want to be viewed, as we shall well, clearly stated. We don't want to be viewed as, when we say the word Guyana, we're looked at as a country that have all these problems going on. We're, we're such, we have so much resources and we can do definitely a lot better as a country. We can definitely move forward, definitely move forward. Over to you. Yes, question. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, so much, but you know, what we've seen um, with regards to what the United States would have done, um, imposing those visa restrictions, and I understand I've seen reports initially and now an official statement from the, the, the government of the UK saying that they, are, they have started the process of imposing sanctions on those who are trying to subvert the will of the people. Uh, Canada has made it clear that they will utilize every single tool at their disposal to ensure that those who are attempting to steal the elections, those who are trampling on democracy, that they are dealt with, um, that there are consequences for their actions. Um, but when one talks about sanction, um, sanction, what we see here is just the beginning cue. Um, it is just the first step. This can get very, very serious, and that is why I alluded earlier that we're going to come and talk about when it reached to the point where it can affect our people. Um, and, and this is where the, all of this can, can end now. We know that it can end now. All that it takes is for the chief um, or, or, or the chief intellectual author of all of this, David Granger, to do the right thing and concede, and all of this can go away. But he seemed hell-bent on holding on to power. Um, and, you know, after you move from, from, from these re visa 
restrictions, it can get much worse for individuals and then morph into sanctions that will affect our country, uh, Utah. Yes, thanks, Ed. Uh, I, I want to begin by saying that David Granger has, I think he has come to the conclusion to focus on being a hero for the PNC. And I think he's trying to build on the legacy of, of, of Forbes Burnham, um, where the part is that you don't ever give up power. And you have to realize he never gave credit to Desmond Hoyt publicly. Desmond Hoyt in 1992 would have conceded matter of two or three days. It was a little pushback, but then he realized that for the people of Guyana, for the well-being of Guyana, he needed to see, right? And he allowed uh, Cherry Jagan to, to assume office and transfer power. Uh, we had some, some difficulties in, in, in that era and so on and so forth. But uh, credit, to, credit to how he, he did the right thing, right? If this uh, was not happy, some of his key uh, members were happy and we, we, I don't want to get into that but the point I'm trying to make to you is that Ranger believes that for him to remain a um, strong and important figure in the PNC he has to go down blazing, as he would say but unfortunately for him he is misplaced in his head he's misplaced he doesn't understand that the party will also <laughs> denounce him when this is all over with. Because when the dust has settled, they will, would have realized that he misled them. Because he is telling the base that he is going to do good by them and he's going to keep power for them. It's not going to happen. And that is why the West repeatedly reached out to Ranger and his administration by saying, listen, we're watching, we're observing, and we believe that you would need to do the right thing. The ambassador, Sarah, Sarah Ann Lynch, said it aptly. She said she witnessed it. She was on the ground. And she is the eyes and ears in Guyana for Washington. She participated in the process after March 2nd, as well as during the recon process. So America is pretty much involved. The UK is involved. Canada is pretty much involved. They are integrally involved. They know what is going on and they know what should be the right thing to do. All they were trying to do is to point him in the right direction, to let him understand that you have to accept the will of the people. We know that you're a dictator. We know what dictators do. Please, don't do that. They were, they were really reaching out to him in a very kind way. But then they began using very strong language, which they had to do because it appears like he did not want to listen. And what the people of Ghana need to understand is, listen, David Granger and his administration were, quote unquote, the people's representatives. The rest of the world would speak to us through those representatives. So for them to continue to have a relationship with Guyana, the people of Guyana, they will have to have the representatives that the people would have elected. And that is no other than, than Dr. Irfan Ali and his list. Those are the representatives that people would have chosen. So they are saying to Guyana, we don't have a problem with the citizens of the country. The citizens have done their job already. They went to the ballot, they casted their votes, they waited patiently for the recount. It revealed similarly what happened March 2nd. So they're saying to Guyana, listen, we will now have to deal with your so-called representatives because they are not accepting your wish. And they are standing in the way of the other representatives that were elected. So we will have to teach them a lesson. So the first round of sanctions were imminent because they recognized, that is the United States and, 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 and our allies, recognized that, listen, 
these guys are, are a little too stubborn for us. And for them to show the people of Ghana that indeed we don't accept what they are doing because it's not consistent with democratic norms, we will have to quote unquote punish them. So the personal these assumptions, which is the first round, it can go deeper. I would imagine that the United States understanding our political and economic realities would not want to move to country sanctions. And I don't think we'll have to get go there because of our size and scale. We're already small, inherently vulnerable. So I don't think they have to do much. I think at the personal level, once they go a bit deeper and they peel away the layers, they will roll over. And you have to understand, the president has not addressed the nation as yet. These are sanctions against him and his, and his cabal. You were supposed to come to the people and say, listen, yes, indeed, we, we, we were sanctioned. And you tell us how we're going to retaliate. That is what nation states do. If you think you have all this power and all this might, and you have all this grandstanding in the international environment, let Congress please tell the people of Ghana and the rest of the world how they will retaliate. Tell us what you will tell Trump. But you, tell us what you'll do. I, I'll interrupt you. If Grange is to come and address the nation, I will tell you what Grange will say. Tell me. I have not violated the Constitution. I have followed, yes. My government has not interfered in GCOM. GCOM is an independent body. I respect the Constitution. Obey any, mm -hmm. respect any declaration by the chairman of GCOM. You have not violated the Constitution. You repeat the same thing again. That is what you will come to tell you. Yeah, he's going to do that. But you have, you have to understand that. <laughs> you have to understand that. I think the rest of the world and Ghana has had would have had enough of that. Um, so I am not too sure how he's going to put together his, his missive. Because he has to report to the people of Ghana. That is his duty um, as the sitting president, uh, even though he's in a caretaker mode. He has to respond to the people of Ghana and to the United States by letting us understand what is going on. Maybe we know what's going on. We know that what the United States has done is justified. Um, and we know that they're speaking directly to them because they're standing in the way of us, the people, right? So he may come and say that, or he may, he, may, he, may, he, may, he may say to, to the people of Ghana, listen, um, GCOM, I'll accept the declaration of GCOM. So let's see what's going to happen next. Let's see what's the next step, because I know they will, think, they will be thinking now, if they make another move, stop the declaration using the national recount figures. They would now be anticipating that the United States would make another move followed by the United Kingdom and Canada. So let's see if they have the word all to stand up now and confront um, our traditional partners who have been very good to us, who've been very kind to us, who've helped us to develop over the last 23 years when we were in office. So let's see what they're going to do. I, I agree with you, Ed, that he's going to say that he is always abided by the constitution, his government has done nothing wrong and all of that. But when you peel away all of that, you know he is behind um, everything that is happening right now. And that is why, that is why my Pompeo said it very explicitly that he should step aside. That is a very strong message from, from the top diplomat within the United States. That's a very strong message. To tell him to step aside is implicit that, listen, you have lost. We see the PVP as, as the victor here. And if an Ali is the duly elected president, and that is what we're going with. That is what we'll accept because that is consistent with the will of the people. They're not taking sides, and they said it clearly. We are not taking sides here. We are not favoring the PPP over the PNC. We are looking at the expressed will of the people. That is all it is. And the PNC standing in that way of that, and they are trying to shield the people from the reality this is a declaration consistent with the national recount figure and that will not happen because the democratic forces are stronger than the dictatorial forces coming out of of congress place thanks to you uh avish i'll bring you in here then avish we have maybe about 10 minutes or so more to go so i'm, I'm going to bring you in then we're going to move to our final issue 
All right. So I, I want to add to what um, you said just now. You know, I'm I'm very thankful for the international community being here for the last four months through all of this. Um, God knows what would have happened if they weren't here. Um, they would have been here. They would have seen everything from the Ashman's building, spreadsheets, bed sheets, you know, and we're here today and they are imposing sanctions to ensure that this dictatorial rule comes to an end and comes to an end swiftly. You know, um, sanctions against any country is devastating, but to, to have a dictatorship rule and govern you, govern you, you know, it, it's uh, sometimes I, I'm lost for words because it's unbelievable. Michelle, it's unbelievable. Michelle, 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 the dictators don't govern. <laughs> you're right, you. You're right. They dictate. Yeah, you're right. Dictate. To, have dictate, to be living under dictatorship, to be living under dictatorship, you know, it, it, in this day and age, it's unfortunate. And I want to thank CARICOM for showing us that they will not tolerate despicable leaders who, um, who, does not stand on the side of democracy um, and thank them for standing for fairness, justice, and righteousness. You know, um, you know, the OS is made up of North America, Central America, and South America. And they, they meet on a forum where they discuss political issues um, and this, they make decisions. And whatever happens here in Guyana will ultimately affect the rest or the other countries in this region, in this part of the world, Caribbean countries as well. And to have them support democracy and peace, these are the very pillars of which the OAS stands on. They support democracy, peace, security, development of countries. And these all include human rights. You know, um, I have all confidence that they will continue to stand by the Guyanese people and the pillars on which they, they were founded. And I know later this, later, or sorry, early next week, I think, the, the, the OAS will be meeting at CARICOM. And okay. there will be harsh consequences and actions meted out to those who continue to subvert the will of the people. Ed? Thanks, um, Avish. Vishala, your closing comments, because we're almost out of time. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, Eddie, it's been um, quite uh, challenging, quite challenging times. Um, like everybody is share is echoing the exact sentiments. Um, the population, they're frustrated, they're fed up. Most of our Guyanese brothers and sisters, I am sure many of them struggling just to make ends meet. They're extremely fed up and they're frustrated. At this point, especially like I mentioned earlier in line with the pandemic, um, at this point in time, I want to um, ask that everyone, of course, remain calm, stay focused, and definitely good sense will prevail at the end of this because right and democracy, democracy could only be right. We cannot subvert the will of the people. Um, like everyone is mentioned, is saying, yes, the international community, we're extremely thankful for the role they have played. I mean, I have to bring this up here. I've never, I, I was listening to um, Dr. Ralph Gonzalez when he mentioned John this source. I've never looked at John this from that perspective, but I think they have been called practically all the names and, and they know what they're doing is absolutely wrong and it's affecting the people. It's affecting our Guyanese brothers and sisters. So Eddie, viewers, you Todd Fischer, I am really, really hoping good sense prevail at the end of all of this. And of course, our Guyanese brothers and sisters, stay calm, be patient. And we will we will win at the end. Democracy will win at the end. Thank you very much, Ed. Ed. Eddie. Uh, thanks, Vishal. Uh, you thought your closing comments. I want Guyanese to, to, to be reassured that democracy is alive and well in Guyana. 
And that is the reason why David Granger was not able to swear in using falsified numbers. That is the reason why, because democracy is still alive and well in Guyana. We have tremendous support from our traditional partners, um, from our international organizations, from our regional partners and organizations. So we are in good company. People have to understand that the progressive party, civic, has always been on the right side of history. Conversely, the PNC has always been on the wrong side of history. But like in any other democracy, once you have good support, there's a possibility that you can get into power. But I believe that this, what we're going through, will be left in the memories of Guyanese for decades to come. Even the unborn, but coming to, coming to this country and, and understand that the PNC is no longer a viable force. They're no longer a credible force. And we will have to, as, as Guyanese, as a political party, to move this country forward and push the PNC into a very small corner. Because you have to understand, colleagues and Ed, the PNC has always been destructive to Guyana. They've done it between 68 and 1992, and they've done it between 2015 and the present day. They've always had a destructive record. We have only one viable party, one choice, and that is the People's Progressive Party Civic. And that is why people went to the polls and voted resoundingly for the, for the People's Progressive Party Civic. There's a reason why. Because they've looked at our record when we were in office, they've looked at our performance in opposition, and they recognized that we were good enough to be back in government. And that is why we are at this juncture where we are waiting for the credible declaration. Dr. Irfan Ali uh, declared the president, sworn in, so that we can move this country forward again. We have to be able come together as a people, because you have to understand, Dr. Irfan Ali is going, to, is going to govern for the entire nation, for every demographic. It doesn't matter what your political affiliation is. He is going to bring everyone on board. He's already mentioned in his manifesto that his policies will be inclusive. We shall talk about you. We will have a youth advisory committee. That's important to advise the president. We have good things in store. We had a good record between 1992 and 2015, and we will only build upon that because the People's Progressive Party is a party that understands development, that understands service, and understands commitment. We are servants, we are elected representatives, and we will do good by the people. So people of Guyana, please, Remain patient, remain vigilant, remain focused. Democracy shall prevail. Uh, thank you, you Todd. Um, a minute, uh, Vishal, for your closing comments. Um, Ed, it is still not too late for Mr. Granger to do the right thing. It is still not too late for him to be a man and do the right thing, put country first, Put country first before party interest, you know. Put the put Guyana in the hands of the youth so that we can contribute to this country and call it our own. You know, that's that's all I can say at this point. You know, because it's been four months, all of our lives have been at a standstill. Young people, young college students who wanted to, or who are waiting for the implementation of policies that will make studies easier for them, access to loans, free education, et cetera, to build on the promises of the People's Progressive Party. We're still waiting. And I feel that as a grandfather to people of Guyana, to the people of Guyana, to the children of Guyana, Mr. Granger should do right for his grandchildren. Thank you. Vishal Sharma, well, 
I should have said from the beginning, Dr. Vishalia Sharma. My apologies. Um, that's not, okay, Eddie. Um, that's, a, that's absolutely okay. I didn't hear you. Sorry. I said I, I apologize for not following protocol. Um, oh, that's totally okay, <laughs> Eddie. Vishalia is fine. You thought, um, Vishal, <laughs> uh, I, I want to thank you guys so much for joining me this evening. And I want to join with you in calling on Guyanese to, to remain calm, to remain um, patient. This will all end very soon. I think we have explored all the options and all of them would have failed. At the end of all of this, democracy and the will of the people will prevail. And like you said, you thought, like um, you said, Vishal and Vishalia, a People's Progressive Party civic government will be in place pretty soon to begin the rebuilding of this country, which was destroyed by Granger and his cabal in five short years. So again, I want to thank you guys for joining me this evening. Thank you for having us. Eddie. Thank you for having us, Eddie. And to our viewers, we want to say thanks for being part of the program. We're going to be back here with you tomorrow uh, for another uh, program of Government in Transition. Until then, we urge all of you to stay safe. Bye.